Okay, good afternoon. I'm so taken aback by the instruction not to begin at 4.30 that I may need a moment to collect myself. My name is Joseph Kearney, and it's a great privilege for me as Dean of Marquette University Law School to welcome you to this year's George and Margaret Barak Lecture on Criminal Law. I'd like to begin by saying a few words about the individuals in whose memory this lecture stands. George Barak was a Marquette lawyer, born in 1907 as the child of immigrants from the area now known as Lebanon, and graduating in our class in 1931. His practice in Milwaukee emphasized family law, although he was fortunate in his own marriage. His wife, Margaret, was not only his partner for life, but assisted him at the firm on administrative matters. A bequest to support an occasional distinguished lecture in George and Margaret Barak's memory was provided by their daughter, the late Mary Bonfield. This is that lecture, which from the outset, almost a decade and a half ago, we determined to devote to criminal law. While this area of the law was not George Barak's own specialty, it is of a piece with his practice, which engaged with, with individuals in our society in their everyday legal problems. Also, criminal law is an historic strength of Marquette University Law School for scores of years insofar as our teaching and our graduates' practices have been concerned and for several decades now also in terms of our faculty's scholarly interests and engagement. So we have been very pleased to offer this lecture annually with a bit of a lacuna because of a pandemic. And we are not just pleased but fortunate to welcome this year's Barak Lecturer. Carissa Byrne Hasek is the Ransdell Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of North Carolina. She also serves as the founding director of the school's Prosecutors and Politics Project. As that may suggest, Professor Hessex's teaching and research interests include criminal law, the structure of the criminal justice system, and criminal sentencing. Since graduating from Yale Law School and before re-entering academe on this side of the podium, her positions included serving as a law clerk to the Honorable Barbara Jones of the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York and Judge Raymond Randolph of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, as well as practicing law in New York City. Professor Hessek has an affinity for us as well, having traveled to Milwaukee and Marquette University Law School for conferences that my colleagues such as Professor Michael O'Hare and Professor Chad Oldfather have organized. Indeed, she knew us when in the old building, as we may think of Sensenbrenner Hall. We are delighted to welcome her back today and to have her speak with the larger Marquette Law School and Milwaukee legal communities. Won't you please join me in welcoming Professor Carissa Byrne Hessek. Thank you very much, Dean Kearney. Um, can I say, when the dean reached out to me and invited me to give this lecture, my initial reaction was to be deeply honored and flattered. And then my second reaction was to be nervous and apprehensive because I realized that I'd have to stand in front of a big room of people and speak for nearly an hour. Now you might be thinking to yourself, I thought this lady was a law professor, isn't that part of her job? But the truth is, law professors have a captive audience that have to pay attention to us because we get to ask them questions and we test them at the end of the semester to make sure that they've been paying attention. So even if we're horribly uninteresting and not engaging, the students pay close attention to what we're saying. I thought about potentially cold calling on people in the audience possibly giving you a pop quiz afterwards, but instead I settled on trying to speak with you today about something that I hope that you will think is important and engaging. It's something that affects every single one of us in this room.
It's our role in the criminal justice system. And you might wonder what I mean by our role. The United States has a uniquely democratic criminal justice system. And in that system, we all have a very important role to play. Now, you might be excused for not thinking to yourself that you have a big role to play in the criminal justice system, because the sad truth is that in the past several decades, that role has been eroded quite significantly. Starting in the second half of the 20th century, a lot of the democratic inputs and democratic checks in the criminal justice system have started to malfunction. Um, and I'll add, I don't think it's a coincidence that that's around the same time that the prison population in this country started to balloon. Since 1970, the rate of imprisonment in this country um, increased five times over. And I suspect, though I don't think I could ever prove, that that's in part because ordinary Americans are no longer paying as close attention to what's going on or having the same voice and input so that they could possibly change things. And instead, the system sort of goes off on its own, a sort of combination of mission creep and agency capture, and don't worry, I'm not gonna use buzzwords like that the rest of the night, I promise. Um, instead, what I hope you'll do is listen along as I talk to you about our democratic criminal justice system, the way that it was formed, what's going on wrong now, and then at the end, hopefully, a little, a little ray of hope about what we can all do to try to improve things. So, let me start with how it is that the US justice system is uniquely democratic. There is no country on this planet that reserves a bigger role for democracy in its criminal justice system than ours does. Now, in part, that's attributable to um, the people who designed this country and the constitution that they wrote, but it's also attributable to changes that were made in the 19th and the 20th centuries that made the system even more democratic. They, they doubled down on the democratic nature of the justice system. So let me start with the democratic feature that's enshrined in the Constitution. Um, and that's the role of lay people in juries and grand juries. Um, so you, you may not know this, but, but just a little refresher in case you've forgotten. Um, in the United States Constitution, though not every single state, Prosecutors can't bring serious criminal charges unless they first go to a group of ordinary Americans, a grand jury, and convince them that those charges should be filed. And then they can't convict a person of a crime without going to another group of people, a petty jury, and convincing them that the person committed a crime and should be punished. Um, now, the people who wrote our Constitution felt very strongly about the inclusion of ordinary Americans in the operation of specific individual criminal cases. In fact, um, they were really outraged that in their time under the, the English crown, that the right to a jury trial had been eroded away and a lot of colonists weren't being allowed to have jury trials. It was actually one of the complaints in the Declaration of Independence. So they enshrined it in the Constitution, and you can read the writings of some of the people who helped shape this country talking about how important they think the jury is to the system of democracy that they created. People like Thomas Jefferson and John Adams wrote eloquently about how important the jury was, at one point saying that if they had to choose between having democratic input into the legislature and democratic input into the judiciary in the form of juries, they'd choose juries. That's how strongly they felt about all of this. Now, when our country was originally founded, juries did more than just find facts. Um, they'd also make legal decisions, and it's, it, it's fun to I think fun, you might think boring, but I think fun to go back sometimes and to read some of the jury instructions that the judges would give them, where the judges are sort of offering their opinions on what the law is, but recognizing that the jurors could decide to do something different. Now that's fallen out of fashion nowadays, you are supposed to do what the judge tells you if you get called for jury duty, but even now, being a juror isn't simply a question of finding facts. It's not just a question of, do you believe the alibi witness? 
judges or juries rather are also asked to make moral judgments because sometimes we've written our crimes or our defenses in a way that requires someone to make a decision. So like a crime that talks about doing something in an unreasonable or unsafe manner. That requires the jury to use their judgment about whether the person acted unreasonably or unsafely. Uh, it's not spelled out for them. They have, to, they have to make up their own mind. This is something that I tell my first year law students about all the time when I teach criminal law. Because some of the crimes that we talk about and some of the defenses have these words in them. And I'm always trying to teach them that when you see the word reasonable or unreasonable, it means the jury is supposed to decide. And I, I sort of, I make it into like a little game so that by the end of the semester, I'm like, what is that? It says reasonable, what does that mean? And they're like, the jury has to decide. One year I had a student partway through the semester get called for jury duty. And the case, I was in Arizona at the time teaching at a law school in Phoenix, and the case was um, a guy had gotten into an argument with an undercover police officer at a public pool. And at some point during the argument, this guy sort of got in the officer's face a little bit and um, used the F word. He was like, F you. Um, and he got arrested for assaulting a police officer and disorderly conduct. So my student is on the jury with all of these other sort of fine citizens. They hear the evidence, they go back to the jury room, and they say, well, look, it's obvious he didn't assault the police officer. Like, that's just dumb. Like, he didn't even know he was an undercover cop. When, or, I'm sorry, an off-duty. Did I say undercover? Off-duty. Off-duty cop when they're arguing. Didn't even know he was a police officer. But then some of the other jurors are like, well, what about this disorderly conduct question? How do we decide that? And my student's like, oh, oh, I know. I learned this in class. It says creating an unreasonable disturbance. And so we have to decide if he should get punished for this. And the other jurors are like, are you sure? And she's like, yeah, yeah, we can send a note to the judge. And they're like, no, that sounds like a lot of work. Um, let's not do that. So they start talking about this. And I'll say I enjoyed my time in Phoenix, but I wouldn't call it like a particularly like sort of buttoned up community. So the jurors are saying things like, what? I mean, I say the F word all the time in public. I, keep, I hear people shouting it all the time. Like, of course that shouldn't be illegal. So they went in and they acquitted that guy. Um, and you might think like, what a strange story for this law professor to tell, but you too know about cases that have turned on questions of reasonableness. Like a case that's closer to home, the Kyle Rittenhouse case, like there was a question there about whether the shooting was justified that required the jury to not just find facts, but to make moral judgments as well. It's an important thing that the jury does. Juries aren't the only form of democratic input in our society. Uh, we also elect criminal justice officials. 45 states elect their local prosecutors, 46 states elect their sheriffs, and many states have some form of judicial elections at some level of their courts, sometimes direct elections, sometimes retention elections. Now, these direct elections are largely attributable to 19th century Jacksonian populism. That is to say, like sort of, in the early 1800s, people are like, why are they appointing all of these people who are supposed to be in charge of our local communities? They didn't like that. They were worried about corruption. They were worried about people from the, the big cities or the state capitals coming to tell the other areas what to do. And so they changed their constitutions so that these officials um, would get elected. And, while appointments largely mean that political insiders make decisions, elections allow outsiders to sometimes step into office. And I think there's a great example of this happening just, a, um, just about five years ago in Philadelphia where the sitting district attorney wasn't running again because he was under indictment and totally went to jail. Um, and so a bunch of other people jumped in to run for the district attorney's office and one of those people his name was Larry Krasner. He was a private attorney. He'd never, you know, he'd never been a prosecutor. He, he did, took a bunch of criminal defense work, and he took a lot of civil rights work. He'd filed 75 lawsuits against the Philadelphia Police Department for violating civil rights of like the people that they're arresting and stuff like that. And when the news came of his announcement, uh, the media immediately called the head of the police union, told him about the announcement. He laughed and literally called the campaign a joke. But Krasner won.
And then he got reelected in 2021 as well. No way someone like him ever could have gotten appointed to the office, but the people of Philadelphia decided that's who they wanted in charge. And I'll add as well that it's not just that local communities can choose political outsiders, they can choose people who might be more responsive to them, people who are more likely to listen when their constituents pick up the phone. Um, in my sort of ruralish, small town kind of place where I live, we just had a contested um, election for our local prosecutor. And, and I called and I asked the candidates if they'd come to the university and talk to the law students since some of them would be voting. And they both showed up to talk to a room of 40 people um, and answer their questions because it's a, don't give me, I mean, look a presidential candidate, a senatorial candidate, they're not gonna care about that sort of thing. But if, if your race is gonna be decided by 120 or 180 or 200 votes, then talking to 45 people sounds like a really good idea. And the students ask them some tough questions. Um, so, so far I've talked to you about how democracy plays a role in the judicial branch with juries, the executive branch with the direct election of sort of sheriffs and prosecutors. Um, and you might be thinking, you don't have to talk about democracy in the legislative branch because obviously we vote for legislators. But I think that that misses an important change that happened in the early 20th century. Um, and that's about how there was a shift in this country from um, uh, judge-made common law to criminal statutes. What do I mean by that? So a lot of the stuff that you think about when you think about crimes, murder, robbery, kidnapping, those things, those have been crimes for a really long time. Like you didn't have to have somebody go to the state house and sit down and write that law. For centuries, those things have been illegal because judges have sort of decided over time that those things should be illegal. So we had these crimes and then defenses as well that were part of the common law. Sort of over time, judges turned them into law. But beginning in the early 1900s, a lot of states started deciding that they wanted the legislature to have control over what was illegal and what wasn't illegal. And so we saw what was called the codification movement, sort of like a fancy word for it. They decided to make these things into the laws that you can find in a book and not just sort of the law that you can glean from reading a judicial decision. And the codification movement didn't just write down the law as it currently existed, they changed it too. A number of states have changed their definitions um, of crimes. They've added a lot of new crimes and new defenses. Um, and criminal legislation is, is pretty popular. I mean, legislatures every year are considering bills about whether to change how crimes are defined or the, the punishments associated with them. And I don't know about you, but I feel as though I see a lot of ads during election season from people who are running for Congress and for State House telling me what they think about crime because they run on those sorts of issues as well. So that's a real sort of movement towards more democratic input that we saw at the end of the 20th century. I'm sorry, beginning of the 20th century. So that's how the system is supposed to work. I promised you that this was gonna be a talk about democratic deficits. And that's what started to happen in sort of the mid to late 20th century. Probably started a little bit before that. But I wanna to talk to you about the ways in which the jury trial, our criminal justice elections, and even our criminal statutes aren't working to bring a lot of democratic input and democratic checks into our system. Let's start with juries. So juries serve as an opportunity for democracy in the criminal justice system only if we actually have juries. And we don't to a large extent anymore. Um, trials have all but disappeared from many courthouses across the country. Right now, somewhere, somewhere around 97, 98, maybe even 99% of convictions are the result of defendants pleading guilty not defendants going to trial and having a jury decide. In 2021, so just last year, the District of Rhode Island, which is the federal court that hears all the criminal cases in Rhode Island, they didn't have a single criminal trial. Every single conviction out of there was the result of a guilty plea. 
Now you might be wondering like, why did this happen? Like why don't we have that many trials? And it's probably a bunch of different things. One thing that happened was for a lot of years now, um, judges have imposed a trial tax or a trial penalty on people who decide to go to trial rather than pleading guilty. And I think that it probably started out as just trying to recognize that if somebody's taking responsibility for having done something wrong, they should get credit for that and they shouldn't be punished as harshly as people who refuse to take responsibility for what they've done wrong. But somewhere along the way, it, it morphed into something else. It went from trying to give some sort of credit or mercy to people who plead guilty to trying to punish those people who won't plead guilty. So Albert Alshuler, a professor in Chicago, uh, tells a story from, I don't know, can't remember if it's the late 1960s or the early 1970s, but a young lawyer that he knew who was appearing in court uh, representing a defendant, and the defendant was facing some pretty serious charges. And it looked as though if he got convicted of those charges, he'd have to serve at least 10 years in prison. And the judge says to this young lawyer, is your client going to plead guilty? And the defense attorney says, you know, Your Honor, um, he says he's innocent, so I can't in good conscience advise him to plead guilty. And the judge got angry. The judge shouted at this lawyer and said, you tell your client that if he doesn't plead guilty, if the jury convicts him, I'm going to make him go away for 20 years instead of 10. If he's going to eat up my time, I'm going to eat up his. You can imagine a lot of people aren't going to go to trial if they're worried that they might get convicted and then have to serve a lot more time in prison. Um, I should add, it's not just judges that pressure defendants into pleading guilty. A lot of times it's prosecutors as well. Um, there's something called plea bargaining, which is where a prosecutor will offer something to a defendant in order to plead guilty, like you know, plead to reduce charges or even dismissing some charges or a sentencing recommendation, something rather than going to trial. And I should say that plea bargaining is actually a relatively recent phenomenon. Um, in the 19th century, plea bargain was really disfavored. Uh, appellate courts, if they got a whiff of the fact that they had um, a guilty plea that was a result of a plea bargain, they would vacate the conviction. They would refuse to enforce the agreements. They said that those sorts of agreements were unlawful. And when people outside the courts found out about them, they would say that plea bargaining was corrupt and haul the, the prosecutor or the judges um, in front of legislative committees or city councils and, and read them the riot act, saying the law makes clear what the punishment is supposed to be if somebody commits this crime. Who are you to give out less punishment? Despite the fact that it was disfavored, there were a lot of really busy urban courts where it just wasn't practical, I think, for all of the cases to be tried, and so plea bargaining flourished in secret. And then through a series of reports aimed at trying to get at urban crime in the 1930s and 40s, people discovered that plea bargaining was going on in secret at a number of Americans' big cities. And I guess at that point, the cat was out of the bag, and people are like, well, they, they're doing it over there and they're doing it over here, maybe we should try it too. And plea bargaining became normal. And at the point that plea bargaining became normal and it became clear that that's how a lot of convictions were being obtained, some legislature stepped into the void and they said, look, if people are gonna plead guilty and get a discount for committing this crime, maybe we should ratchet up what the penalties are. Or maybe we should enact um, a bunch of overlapping crimes so that prosecutors can stack them on top of each other and dismiss some of the charges. And so now, it's not that defendants necessarily get a good deal when they plead guilty. Sometimes they're just doing, trying to avoid a really bad deal if they go to trial. Now, I should say, I could stand here and talk to you about plea bargaining for a really long time. I literally just published a book about plea bargaining where I say that plea bargaining is bad. Like, it's bad for defendants, it's bad for victims, it's bad for truth, it's bad for justice. What I want to focus on here, though, is it's bad for democracy. Because juries are no longer standing between a prosecutor and a conviction. Right? The prosecutor alone gets to decide in most cases whether somebody shot someone else in self-defense. 
or whether screaming the F word in public is disorderly conduct. It's the prosecutor who makes that decision. Um, and I should add, a lot of prosecutors think this is a feature, not a bug. There's an essay um, in the Yale Law Journal by Arlen Specter. You guys might know him as like the longtime senator from Pennsylvania, but before he was elected to the Senate, he was elected um, to a local district attorney office in Pennsylvania. And he wrote this essay about plea bargaining, which he generally wasn't a fan on of, except in serious cases. He said, look, if you have somebody who's facing a murder conviction, but they want to raise a self-defense claim, or if they want to raise like a provocation claim, which would get them like a, a lesser conviction, those questions are too important to leave to juries. The lawyers should hammer that out. And I guess I feel the exact opposite way. I feel like it's because there are pro these questions are important that not only prosecutors and defense attorneys should be left to make those decisions. Because the truth is, those decisions are made in public sometimes, and they're hard to defend. I'll, I'll give you an especially egregious example of that. The Jeffrey Epstein case out of Florida, where federal prosecutors agreed not to file any federal charges against a serial predator who took advantage of many, many underage girls in return for him pleading to some not particularly serious state charges that had him out of jail in 14 months, I think it was, with work release. It was, um, it was a deal that when it became public, there was a huge outcry. It was kept secret for a reason. Nobody really wants to defend that sort of a deal Many of these plea deals are relatively secretive. Now, I want to be clear. Like, I'm standing here and I'm telling you that juries stand between prosecutors and a conviction. I don't want to pretend like we're going to love all the decisions that juries make. Like, juries get it wrong sometimes. Like, the exoneration stories tell us that. Um, I imagine if you think about it, you can think of at least one high-profile case where you have some reservations or some doubts or some downright dislike about the verdict that was reached by a jury in that case? Me too. But I'd say when it comes to democracy, I got a lot of reservations that get made. Like, I look around and I see some pretty unserious people with questionable moral characteristics and some even worse policy preferences getting elected every day. So I guess when it comes to juries, I'd, I'd want to paraphrase Winston Churchill on democracy, right? So he said democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others that have been tried. I'd say that's probably true about juries. Like juries are actually a pretty rotten way to resolve a criminal case, but they're better than the alternative. Okay, it isn't just juries um, that have eroded over time. Uh, it's also problems when it comes to the criminal justice elections. And the problem here is different, right? I mean, people are still being elected. Just earlier this month, we had a slew of prosecutors and sheriffs and judges elected across the entire country. The problem with those elections is that they're often uncontested and voters are often uninformed or misinformed when casting their ballots. Um, so I touched a little bit on this during the lunchtime presentation that I gave, uh, where I explained that our research that we've done shows that most prosecutors take office without ever facing an opponent at the ballot box. Um, only 30% of elected prosecutors have faced a challenger either in their general or their primary election. The other 70% just unopposed go right into office. Um, there's some research on sheriffs that suggests that the rate is similar. 60 or 70% of sheriffs in the United States don't face an opponent on the ballot. Um, and I think it's pretty simple to just observe that if voters don't have a choice in an election, then they can't change things if they don't like what's happening. And things are a little bit different when it comes to these criminal justice offices than it does more generally. So, Indulge me for a second and, and think about something else you might be annoyed at. Like, so maybe, maybe you don't like how your public schools are being run. Maybe you have a kid in the school, maybe you don't. It doesn't matter if you are a teacher or have an, uh, you know, a background in education. If you don't like what's happening, you can just run for school board. 
Um, actually, my colleague's daughter just got elected to like the San Francisco school board. A lot of people not in there anymore because people didn't like how the schools were being run. She's not a teacher, she's a lawyer, she just cares about the issue and so she's gonna work hard to change things in her community. That's not so easy when it comes to these criminal justice elections, right? Think about what it takes to be a prosecutor or a judge. At a minimum, you need to be a lawyer. And a lot of Americans aren't lawyers. I know a lot of people in this room are lawyers, but most Americans aren't lawyers. So if they don't like the decisions that are being made in the courtrooms in their communities, they can't decide to run for office. Um, and, and even for sheriff, I mean, you, you, sheriff, you don't have to be a lawyer, but a number of states have qualification requirements that you either have to be a current or a former law enforcement officer to be able to run for sheriff. So somebody who's just not happy with what's happening can't get their name on the ballot and run. And, and to be clear, there are good reasons for those restrictions. I'm not saying judges shouldn't be lawyers, prosecutors shouldn't be lawyers. Like, no, no, I understand why we have those qualifications. I think what we just have to notice and pay attention to is the fact that that gets in the way of democratic change, especially because it's pretty clear that in some of these places, it's hard to find anyone to run for these offices. We heard a little bit about why from our panelists this morning, and I'll just add in the races that we studied, we found more than a dozen places where they couldn't find anyone to run for local prosecutor and they had to end up appointing someone from outside. Even when there are contested elections, there are democratic deficits as well. A lot of voters don't know much about um, the relevant issues. There's a, a real lack of media reporting when it comes to what's happening in specific communities. So we're, we're finishing a pilot study of media coverage that it, of prosecutor elections that's showing some candidates get zero mentions in the newspapers at all. They're never mentioned. And even those, those candidates who are mentioned, um, there's rarely any discussion about their policies or their platforms that they're running on. And that's what voters need to know about in order to make informed decisions. And you might think to yourself, do they really need to know this? They do. I mean, we don't give police, we don't give sheriff's offices and prosecutor's offices the resources that they need to pursue every single suspected case of a crime. They have to triage and they have to prioritize. They have to make decisions about what they're going to pursue and what they're not going to pursue. And sometimes they do that just based on the strength of the evidence, but sometimes they do it based on other things as well. I mean, I don't know about you, but I've seen sheriffs in the news who say they're not going to prosecute um, laws about gun ownership because they think it's not consistent with the Second Amendment. And I've also seen news reports about prosecutors saying they're not gonna prosecute marijuana offenses because they think they're stupid. So, there are policy decisions that are made, sometimes for sort of what look like policy or political reasons, and other times just based on necessity, and voters need information about those decisions in order to be able to cast and form ballots. But voters don't know. It's not even just that the media isn't covering these things, it's that these decisions, when not to file charges, when not to arrest someone, those don't usually leave any footprints. Even like a super boring academic who is really persistent can't find this stuff out a lot of the times. It's really hard to figure out what people decided not to do. And because of that, unless you have a high profile case, you often can't figure out what's happening. I don't know what the marijuana enforcement policies are in my local office or the DUI enforcement policies or the threshold for when the local prosecutors are willing to bring um, charges about sexual assault. Like, these are things where we know that across the country, um, law enforcement take different approaches on, but I know a heck of a lot more about when James Comey is gonna file charges for mishandling classified documents, which affects me not at all, only because he got hauled in front of Congress to talk about that kind of stuff. But the stuff that really affects us, most of us don't know the answers to those questions. Lastly, I'll say on the topic of elections, 
it's not just that voters don't have access to information, sometimes they're actually wrong. Sometimes they think they know things, but they don't. Um, so some of you might be familiar with um, the research that shows people always think that crime is going up. Like even when crime is going down, a majority of Americans, when asked, they say crime is going up. So the um, the polling folks at Pew, they ask this question pretty regularly, and people are always saying it's going up. Sometimes it's, you know, everyone's saying it, and sometimes it's only a majority of people saying it, but it doesn't matter if crime is going up or down, most Americans still think that crime is going up. Um, this isn't the only sort of public opinion polling stuff that, that troubles me. I, there's, a, there's a survey that was done, I believe it was in Illinois, uh, where voters were asked questions about whether they thought their communities were too harsh on crime, too lenient on crime, or just right. And everyone was like, oh, yeah, yeah, no, no, too, too lenient. And they're like, okay, well, what about when it comes to burglary? Too lenient, okay. What do you think someone should get? Like, what should their sentence be if they're convicted of burglary? And people are like, well, two, three years. That's not what people get for committing a burglary. Like, they get a lot more than that. So it's not just that people didn't know what was happening in their system. Um, and by the way, I should say, these people were asked in a place where it was five years, whatever it was. So maybe that's, maybe that's not what it is here. But this place in Illinois, they had the stats. It was five years. Okay, maybe it was armed burglary. I don't know. I can give you the citation later if you're interested. Um, but the problem wasn't just that they didn't know what was happening in their system, it's that they thought they knew. They thought they knew and they thought that something bad was happening. And so what do you think happens, right? When people think crime is always going up and the people in their community are being too soft on crime, what do you think they're gonna do in elections? They're gonna, you know, they're gonna vote for people who say that they'll be tougher on crime. And this, by the way, you don't have to read some study about burglary in Illinois to know this, right? Like, we all just sat through an election cycle. I don't know what kind of ads you guys saw here in Wisconsin. I'm told by CNN that crime was a campaign issue. I'll tell you what happened in North Carolina. There were mailers sent out um, in some close state house races. Uh, I don't really know anything about the group that sent them out, but they were photoshopped to show um, candidates wearing t-shirts that said defund the police. They didn't say defund the police, they didn't wear that t-shirt. Uh, another guy was photoshopped, um, there was a picture of him standing and waving at a parade in his district, and they photoshopped that to make him standing and waving at a bunch of rioters, I think like trying to set a courthouse on fire. Yeah, so, um, uh, obviously those, those problems are, those things are bad, um, but people think that they can win elections by focusing on, by not just focusing on crime, not just telling people this is my particular plan to solve this particular problem, but by using crime as a wedge issue, trying to scare people um, to get them to support candidates who will say and do certain things. Now, look, I'm saying things that you guys are probably like, yeah, yeah, I've heard people on the news talking about how like crimes used to elect certain people. I'm not really here to tell you that like I'm concerned about who's getting elected and who's not getting elected. I'll tell you I'm concerned about how this affects crime policy. Whether people feel as though they can vote in favor of criminal justice reform. Um, they can vote in favor of bills that might change the way the criminal code works, or whether they're worried that they'll be attacked as soft on crime, having done something like that afterwards. Um, I do think that if you, if you take a look at our criminal codes, which is the last thing that I need to talk to you about, you can see some of the effects of this. Um, it's pretty clear that the people who are in office enact a bunch of laws designed to make the criminal code much bigger and much harsher. The study that we conducted of prosecutorial lobbying that I talked about earlier today was fun to look at what the prosecutors did. Ultimately, I thought the prosecutors had a, a pretty mixed record, actually a really good record when it came to reform sometimes. But what was horrifying to me was how many bills were introduced in order to make the law harsher 
to increase the number of crimes and the punishment. And even when prosecutors objected to these bills, the legislatures often still enacted them. So there's a sense that crime is an issue that you can get, it's an easy way to win elections, I think is what I'm trying to say. That's the perception and the consequence isn't just who gets elected, the consequence is what do the laws look like? Because I said that getting legislatures involved mean that our codes are more democratic, but the truth is the things that people care about, they're already illegal, right? If there's something that you think is bad, I can find you a statute that says it's a crime. How is it that every year legislatures across this country find new crimes to enact, well, they have to be kind of creative. Sometimes they enact the same thing with slightly different wording. That Those are the overlapping statutes that can get stacked that give a lot of leverage to prosecutors some places for plea bargaining. Sometimes it's about jacking up um, the punishment associated with things. Sometimes it's just about pushing the law outward to criminalize more things until at the end of the day, we have things that are criminalized that a lot of people think shouldn't be criminal after all. Um, a lot of stuff that is kind of ordinary behavior is illegal. Um, you can't share your Netflix password. That's, that's illegal. Um, in North Carolina, uh, we outlawed gambling. And there's no exceptions for friendly wagers between friends. And so some enterprising prosecutor arrested a bunch of senior citizens at a retirement home for playing a nickel and dime game. This was not recently, this is like in the 70s. Um, but I talk about it because those retirees were mad and they went to the papers and they got a reporter to write a story. And the reporter went to the state house and got like the chair of the Judiciary Committee on record to be like, did you know that the law could do this? And he's like, yeah. He's like, are you going to change the law? And he's like, no. But in the future, prosecutors should use better judgment. <laughs> There's no sense that the laws themselves that the, that the time that the legislature spends crafting laws should be time that's about trying to figure out how do we write laws that actually address the things that we don't like and exclude the things that we don't think should be criminal. That's, that's just not what ends up happening. And instead, what ends up happening is that we have these bloated criminal codes that cover all sorts of behavior, including behavior that people don't think is blameworthy. Now, if you had a jury system that was functioning and these cases got brought in front of a jury, a jury could say, that seems stupid, let's not convict. But if most people are plea bargaining or, or saying, give me diversion instead of a misdemeanor conviction, a lot of people are going to do that instead. Now, I'll say that other countries deal with a lot of the problems that I've identified by giving more power to like experts or elites. Uh, one example that, um, that a colleague of mine always points to is that the death penalty is outlawed in Europe, not because Europeans don't support the death penalty, but because they don't leave that in the hands of voters. Like the majority of Europeans also think capital punishment should be fine, they just don't give them that sort of input. Whereas here in the United States, we have a lot of democratic input, and so the fact that a majority of Americans think that capital punishment is okay means that most states still have the death penalty on the books. That said, so I don't think that like bringing in elites and experts is the answer. I know I've painted a super bleak picture today that democracy isn't working. I still hold out hope that there are things we could do to change the problems I've identified. Here are three things that I think we can do. First of all, I think that we should applaud judges who push back against some of the trends that I mentioned. Um, this includes uh, judges who have, um, every time they get a, a plea bargain in their courtroom, 
ask the prosecutor to explain what the original charges were and what were the grounds for the plea bargain and why they think that was the right result. Because then it's a matter of open record and members of the media and ordinary Americans can find out what the policies are of those offices. Um, some judges are a lot less tolerant of vaguely worded statutes. And I should say, these things don't have to be political. Like, I see judges who were, you know, who get identified as Democrats and judges who get identified as Republicans doing these sorts of things. Like, if you want to read some great stuff, read Justice Gorsuch pushing back against broadly written statutes. Like, it's pretty, it's pretty exciting stuff. Second, there have been efforts at creating more transparency and accountability that will allow for more democratic input. Some states have passed laws requiring the reporting of more information and making it publicly available. Some offices do this of their own accord. Some prosecutors' offices publish statistics. And it's not just big city offices that do this too. There's a group called the the prosecutorial performance indicators, it's run by folks at Florida International and Loyola Chicago, and they work with small and medium-sized offices to help them get their data and make it accessible for the people in their district so they can learn more about what's being done. And third, I see a lot more interest in these criminal justice elections that I just mentioned. I see national stories about races for sheriff, races for DA. We've seen more contested elections in the large cities, and those elections can have ripple effects. I got a call just a few weeks ago um, from a prosecutor uh, who'd won a contested race in North Carolina. And he said to me that when he was out campaigning, a voter asked him if he was going to make changes in his office to be more transparent. And, um, and he won the election. And he was calling to say, how do I make my office more transparent? And I hooked him up with the people at the prosecutorial performance indicators. And by the way, I should say, I'm not the hero in that story. And the prosecutor's not the hero in the story. The hero in that story is the voter who asked that question. We can all ask those questions. And it's not just the people in this room. You can tell other people that you know, did you know that we have this role to play in the criminal justice system? We should be paying attention to the sorts of laws that are getting enacted. The people who are running for office, we should ask questions. We should ask, why is it that there are 13 million misdemeanor cases processed every year in this country as compared to one million felony cases? I don't know that that's the best use of our resources. We can ask these questions and maybe things will change. At a minimum, at a minimum, we'll have done our part. So I hope you guys will ask questions and pay more attention. I know I'll be asking, actually, and I did, by that I didn't mean right now, though you can ask questions now. Um, but I hope you'll join me because it's, it's really, it's everyone's responsibility to pay attention to these things. So we do have time for questions, and no questions now would be a very bad uh, sign and leave Professor Hessek without hope for the future, which we don't want. So uh, if you can raise your hand, and I will recognize you, and Eric will be able to um, fix the microphone so that we're able to hear your question. Pardon me. Yes, Judge Donald. and said, I'm an activist judge, given that that term can be politicized, how, how is that really going to help in reforming the process? Yet, yeah, I don't know that you have to use that word, well, right? <laughs> well, but, but you said more active judges. So, you know, it, it depends on how you want to spend that phrase. Yeah, no, I, I guess I'd put it this way. Maybe you could be a non-deferential judge, or a, a judge fulfilling the judicial power, right? Acting as a check and balance in our constitutional system. I mean, I leave it to, to people who spend less time in an office with the door closed and a lot of old books open on their desk to think about how to craft these messages in a way that they'll resonate. But I do, I, I see a lot of messages. Let me use Justice Gorsuch as an example, right? I don't think he thinks of himself as an activist. I don't think he thinks that at all. 
right? He uses different language to take what I would call a more active or maybe less passive role in reviewing criminal statutes. So I, I think that what I would say was it could be spun as a question of democracy, right? The people are going to have questions about these sorts of decisions that are being made in the courtroom. Can you tell me more before I accept this guilty plea, which is a response, I'm talking about trial court judges, right? They have a responsibility to accept the pleas and enter a conviction. Maybe that responsibility could involve a little bit of peeking behind the curtain about how that particular plea bargain was arrived at. I believe you also had a question. Okay. My, my first career was in the uh, Judge Advocate General's Court. I was a defense counsel, prosecutor, and a military judge. And uh, you probably know in, in the military, if you select a jury trial or a trial with members, that means the members also have the right to sentence you. And, it's, uh, and so, uh, if, for example, in a, in a death penalty case, only, only a court can sentence the individual to death, and it has to be a unanimous vote by, by the court members. And you see, uh, you know, there, I know from living in Virginia that, um, I in Virginia, at least when I was there, I believe, that if you ask for a jury trial, you certainly got the right to a jury trial, but then you got, at the other end, the right to be sentenced by that same jury. Um, in my experience as, as a, a lawyer, that is a very um, disincentive to having a jury trial, even though, for example, in the military, a, a court members would generally all be college graduates, very well educated, but still, you, you're rolling the dice, you simply don't know. Uh, um, and I was just wondering what your views on that were. Yeah, it's an excellent question, and it's true. I mean, I've I've heard from my colleagues who spent time in the in in the JAG Corps that um, that they thought the system was a lot more democratic and and interesting the way things were sort of set up there with the the lawyers sort of taking on different roles. Um, uh, there's been some research on the I think it's six states that still have jury sentencing um, by some other professors um, trying to look into why it is that more defendants don't take advantage of jury sentencing because they don't they don't seem to want it and the conclusion um, I think it's Nancy King who wrote about this seemed to be that the instruct at least in some places the instructions that were given to juries seemed to suggest that they had um, sort of a, a smaller range in which they had to sentence, whereas judges understood that they had a lot more flexibility. And it wasn't necessarily, it was hard to say, that juries were being harsher when they sentenced than judges were. It was instead that the impression was created that that lower range, that they weren't supposed to use it, and the judges knew that they could. Well, one, of, one of the things, of course, and, and Congress has been asked to, to look at it is you don't have to, I mean, if you want a jury trial, you could have the jury trial and then have the judge do the sentencing. But there's been great resistance to that. Um, and, and so, you know, the, the benefit is even uh, w would be that you, you have a judicially trained person doing the sentence as opposed to just a random, you know, taking a shot at it. Yeah, no, it's true. And I, I should add, by the way, um, even though I think more democracy would ultimately make the system less harsh, I don't think it's going to happen right away. I actually think if you ask a lot of Americans, they think crime is a really serious problem. And there are a lot of crimes that they can mention that they think people are not getting enough punishment for. I think what changes over time is once they realize the safety valves that had to be built into the, the escape valves, right, to let all of the pressure out because of all of the people who are being brought in to the system and how sort of little time and attention there is to spend on the more serious cases. So when I talk to people, I point out to them, like, did you know how few serious violent crimes get solved in this country? And they don't. They don't tend to know that, like, a third of robberies get solved and the other two thirds don't. And, and a lot of times when we have the conversation about crime, we say the people who are in the system are getting off too light. I do think that if people knew more and saw the consequences of the decisions that are being made, that they'd ask for some different priorities. But I might be wrong. I'm constantly shocked by what democracy does. Um, but I'm willing to say 
that's democracy. I think we have time for a couple more questions. Yes, please. Yeah, because the way the system is set up right now, um, if you go, lots of places, not every place, but a lot of places that if you go to trial, you'll just get a harsher sentence. Like it's, it's set up that way. So some places they do this through mandatory guidelines. Some other places do this because there are sort of like um, diversion programs available, but only if you plead. But basically the leniency in the system in most but not all places is designed to require people to plead guilty in the first place. I don't think that you can ask people to suffer that sort of harshness without, just in order to get the right to a jury. I mean, like, look, we have plea bargaining for a reason. Like, defendants are better off on an individual basis if they plea bargain than if they go to trial. Like, that's why they have it. It's just that the system overall has become more harsh. I think you'd have to change those laws, right? You'd have to make things like diversion available for people who don't want to plead guilty. You'd have to get rid of a bunch of the mandatory minimums that are largely just used for people who won't plead. You you have, to, you have to change the sentencing guidelines. You have to change all of those things in order for trials to not be such a bad deal anymore. Yes, please. So you talked a lot about, um, exciting. Um, you talked a lot about prosecutors and judges and juries, and I know that there are some defense attorneys in the room. So maybe you could give us a little hope because it feels like there isn't any for us here. Well, I'll say this. Um, I think that defense attorneys have had a pretty good run of it, or I'd say a better run of it in recent years, um, getting folks to listen to the messages that they think are important. I think that um, I certainly read a lot more coverage in the media that's much more tempered that's skeptical of taking um, uh, statements from law enforcement at face value, um, that does spend time getting into the systematic problems, or the systemic, I should say, problems with the system. Maybe that was duplicative to put it that way. Um, I'd say that I don't think we should have democracy when it comes to public defense. So I'm not a fan of like the Florida model where the public defender stands for election. I don't think that's a good idea. I think oftentimes those races are run by people who promise to um, make public defense cheaper. And I don't, I don't, I think that's bad. Um, I don't think that, uh, that constitutional rights like that should be up for grabs in elections. They're constant, like the right to counsel. I think they're constitutional rights for a reason, but I, I certainly feel as though I've seen a number of folks from the defense community uh, change the conversation in this country. So there's, there's the little spark of hope, okay. <laughs> so I think I want to do uh, three things. One is to say that we will continue this conversation in a more informal sense right outside in the Zilber Forum and I know that Professor Hessek would be pleased to meet yet more of you than she already has today in a couple of appearances here in the Lubar Center, so please join us outside. Second, I want to thank all of you for coming to what I think we can once again uh, call our annual Barak Lecture on Criminal Law. Uh, we can do that, right? We can <laughs> promise that there will never be another pandemic, uh, sure. And <laughs> third, and uh, most importantly, I want to say thank you to Carissa Byrne Hasek for another great outing here at Marquette University Law School. New building or old. Thank you.